Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Mortgage Coach training call. Uh, every Tuesday morning, we're here. I'm Dave Savage, CEO of Mortgage Coach, to deliver ideas, leadership, inspiration. Uh, you know, every year I think about taking off, you know, the week of Christmas, the week between Christmas and Thanksgiving, excuse me, between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, and every week I'm surprised with just how many folks show up. You know, last week we had over 200 mortgage coaches on this call, and this week it looks like we got a good shot of having another 200. So uh, thank you for um, your attention. Thank you for all the contributions that you make throughout the year to Mortgage Coach. Uh, I'm grateful, and everybody on the Mortgage Coach team is grateful. Hopefully you get a lot of value out of this. I do want to remind everybody on this call, these calls are recorded. Uh, I think this call is going to be one of those where if people really knew how great this conversation between myself and Tammy Butler was going to be, we'd have thousands of people on this call. But uh, just remember, it is recorded, and if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's as simple as going to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button. Last week's call with Coach um, Mike Reagan was awesome, so being able to have a Building Champions coach come in and he did about 10, 15 minutes on life planning. And then we spent the majority of the call going through business planning for loan officers. So, you know, he took us through this worksheet around how to figure out your, you know, how much you get paid an hour to really understand how your time is valuable as a mortgage professional. And then he came up with this, you know, editable business plan, three pages. You walk away with what are your big picture goals? and breaking those down into the details. What are you going to master? So if you missed that call and you haven't done your business plan or your life plan, listen to that call. And um, also I have put, uh, Marcy and I have put the handouts, the editable business planning tools in the, the handout section of today's meeting. So feel free to go in there and get those. So a um, couple things before we get into the, the main content today. We are unleashing what we consider to be the 12 best uh, videos slash recordings of 2015's calls. It's probably no surprise to anyone that the number one uh, call, Tuesday call for 2015, was Simon Sinek's interview. Uh, definitely my personal favorite. That's been an interview I've been trying to get for years, so I'm really fired up that Simon likes our mission, took the time to come in and give value Hopefully, we'll bring Simon back in 2016. Number two was the editor of Success Magazine, Darren Hardy. Uh, just an unplugged conversation with Darren. I mean, he's a personal friend, so he comes in every year, and I'm sure we'll have him again. Uh, number three most viewed call was Dave Ramsey, another fantastic call. Again, the, the Dave Ramsey mission and the, the whole concept that if you are getting financial advice, get that advice from someone at the heart of the teacher is near and dear to my heart and to the whole mortgage coach team's heart. Uh, number four on the list was the Gaylord Hansen team. Uh, just an incredible team in the San Diego market that does over 500 loans per year. That's helping over 500 families a year refinance and purchase homes. And they're just major power users of mortgage coach. If there was one mortgage coach video from 2015 that I promise you as a mortgage professional if you listen to it, and if you actually implement 50% or even 20% of what we talk about in this call, you will close more loans. You will increase your production by 10, 20. You could even double your production just based off of this video. So while we've got a lot of great um, calls that we did last year, this one would be my number one recommendation to watch. Um, number five and number six were two realtors, uh, realtor um, Glenn Bill, out of Indiana, and then the number one realtor in America, Ken DeLeon, were number five and six. Uh, I was stoked, you know, that we had, last year we had three women that made the top 12, this year we had four. Um, Nikki Groff last year was the number one woman. Uh, this year she was the number one woman, and she made the top 12 list, so congratulations to Nikki. Uh, Chris, uh, Christine Messerly, her whole message around millennial, you know, how to sell, and market to millennials was number eight. And then we had uh, Kelly Zitlow with Cherry Creek Mortgage as number nine, focusing on how to leverage video. Uh, I love Kelly's quote, uh, and Tammy, I know you will too, 
my mission is to deliver an honest, well-communicated, knowledge-based lending experience. That's how we kicked off the call. You, you like that one, Tammy? Oh, that's so very important, especially with the millennials coming up. They are super into that, so right on with Kelly. Yeah, she, she crushed it. And then we had Marty Preston with Benchmark, just crushed it with how to create clients for life with an in-office experience. 90% of his clients come into his office, and he just nailed it. And then number 11 and number 12, we had Jen in the Washington, D.C. market on how her whole approach to EduCell. And we had Jay Crowell out of the Seattle market with Cornerstone, just a top producer interview. And he's, you know, in my opinion, one of the, the greatest leaders in our business. You know, just a great branch manager, great personal producer. So um, that was a review of that. I did post that on my Facebook link. I did a Facebook, or not Facebook, but a LinkedIn post. So check it out and share it with your team. So, so to kick off this call with Tammy, uh, I want to I just get laser clear. I think everybody on this call believes what Tammy and I believe, and we believe that the best loan officers are the best teacher. I mean, at Mortgage Coach, that is why we created the total cost analysis. Uh, and, and, and I believe, and Mortgage Coach team believes, that when it comes to quoting rates, whether it's a prequal, whether it's doing a break-even analysis for a family considering a refinance, whether it's a first-time home buyer, you know, trying to decide is now the time to buy, that when you when you get into mortgage debt, you want to really have an educational experience. You want to get advice. That means the loan officer has to ask great questions, and then that loan officer has to, you know, align the family's goals with their mortgage options. And that's what we're all about here at Mortgage Coach. So so Tammy is an executive with Optimal Blue. I'm going to let her tell her story, but uh, I, I've got to know Tammy better in 2015, and I, I hope to have her as a regular in 2016 because this woman, it, when you hear her story, you hear what she's accomplished, and then you hear what she's currently doing on the Optimal Blue team, I think you'll know why I brought her into this call, and I think it will be really clear how she's going to help everybody better leverage technology to, to sell and teach better. So. So Tammy, welcome to the Mortgage Coach Call. Why don't you uh, tell a little bit about your backstory and what your role is in the industry today? All right. Well, thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. And you know, I'll, I'll tell my backstory. It might give away my age, but um, I did everything very quickly for the audience. <laughs> but thirty some years in the industry, and really, my background is highly diverse. I've done everything from uh, tripping into the industry, like most of us have. Uh, in the closing and auditing part of this, all the way through uh, becoming a top originator at one time, owning the largest training school in the mortgage industry, the largest mortgage publication, um, ended up in technology, and from the technology foray, ended up in um, into Optimal Blue. So really a very di diverse background, everything that you can imagine from the front to the back I've been involved in. And really, uh, my heart has always been around what are the complex problems that we see in our industry, how can we solve them, and what is it going to take to do that. And I think that's how I ended up in technology, because as it began its infancy in our business, we began to see how important that was going to be as we move forward. Uh, so in a nutshell, I've been there and done it with just about everything, underwriting, operations, compliance, origination, sales management, training. It's all there, and I think that that uh, builds a background that helps you solve some of the issues that we've had. Uh, my latest uh, thing that I'm into now is, is really understanding the millennial market and how we can position ourselves a little bit better for that. And because of that, uh, my son expressed an interest. He's a millennial, 26-year-old. And two of his friends, they expressed an interest in our industry. Um, I did my best to say, geez, I'm not sure. This is kind of you know, a rough time to get into it, but if you really want to go down this road, what I will do is I will spend a year with you, and every week we'll get together, and I'll train you what we'll call the technical aspects and then finally the sales aspects of trying to get your business started. Uh, and so with that, I learned probably just as much as they did easily about mm -hmm. not only their generation, their expectations, and their view of our industry. Well, 
Well, just to set the table for everybody on this call, you're speaking to a, an amazing woman leader in our industry. She's she's worked on the back end of of the of the industry. She's worked as a loan officer. She's managed loan officers as a production leader. She's trained hundreds, thousands of loan officers, and now today she's one of the, the, the key executives at Optimal Blue, taking that expertise and, and creating systems and tools so that mortgage professionals and mortgage lenders can deliver a more compliant experience. So uh, I think the fact, you know, I think we could do a call all around that, you know, turning compliance into a competitive advantage from a sales perspective. But uh, today, you know, the, it really hooked me and why I asked Tammy to come in is that experience with her, with, her, with her son and their friends, I think there's a lot to be gained by that. So before we get into telling that story, Tammy, I, I've been asking this question. Uh, I started asking it on Saturday. So literally I was doing some pre-planning before my family woke up. You know, I had planned on completely disconnecting this last weekend, but I was, I was kind of just reading some business planning early, early in the morning. I saw this interview from a top um, mortgage CEO. You know, this is a CEO of one of the, the 20 largest, you know, fastest growing lenders, probably even in the top 10 non-bank lenders. And, and so I actually sent this email out to about a half a dozen uh, friends, CEOs, leaders in the space, people that I thought would give me a valuable and interesting um, answer. By the way, I was really surprised that almost everybody responded. I thought everybody would not be on email and wouldn't even see this, and they'd be like, "What is Savage doing emailing me?" You know, the day after Christmas. You know, but I, I wanted to get the answer from a lot of folks. So let's start the call with you answering this question, and then let's get into the millennial story. Okay. Do you think technology will disrupt consumer lending the same way Google, Uber, Netflix, Facebook, and Apple disrupted the status quo in their areas? 100% absolutely yes. Um, I'm very familiar with a couple of big technology Silicon Valley companies that are incubating mortgage lenders right now. Um, they do see this as a, a, a future forward type of platform and as a result they're studying us and trying to figure out how we can do things better. Um, so technology is one of those things that as it begins to advance year after year after year. We couldn't have believed this 20 years ago, but now we're starting to see that each year it gets a little bit more savvy, and as that gets more savvy, we have to get savvy with it. And this is what part of what the millennials can teach us, is we kind of get caught in, this is the way we've always done it, this is the way we should be doing it. Real estate agents get caught in that as well. And until we are disrupted with something painful, it's unlikely that we say, oh gosh, maybe I should change that. So that's my interpretation of, of that question. And, and I have no doubt, um, it's not even an opinion, I have no doubt that it's going to change the way that we do things. A absolutely. And so far, everybody I've asked has said, absolutely. You know, some have said that Quicken Loans has already created some disruption with how they're using a combination of, you know, uh, technology and they have an organization and, and loan officers and professionals that are delivering a consistent experience. So that sets the table. Oh, and, oh, yeah, and Garrett to... Strait is another example. You know, they, they're, they're out there with the digital mortgage and if you're using paper and faxes, how old you look. <laughs> that really resonates with the younger people that are buying. No, no, no doubt about it. So let's get into the millennial story, what you learned, you know, how you want to deliver this, this lesson to the mortgage coach community. I've got your first slide up, but feel free to have me move through these and uh, let's break it down. So if you could tell us what you've learned and what makes the millennial special, you know, what can we learn as baby boomer and Gen X mortgage professionals? Absolutely. Well, the first thing I, I, I think it's important to say is they hate to be studied. They, you know, there's 87 million of them and they say, listen, we're not all the same. Just like all the baby boomers are the same, they are not all the same. And um, so you've got different types of personalities within that, just like boomers have different types of personalities. So to try to put them in, into what we'll call the proverbial square, square peg in the round hole, uh, they're not too fond of that. 
So it's important to understand that you're going to have different types of millennials as you're working with them. Another thing I think that we fail to address in our industry is how are we going to onboard these newer talents into our industry? And if you, you can kind of look the way that we onboarded way back when, and we just kind of started and they said, go pass out rate sheets, and that was really our only training. And we had to figure things out a little bit for ourselves, but it was easier to get access to people. They were actually in offices. Uh, we didn't have these technology uh, walls up between us where you walk into a real estate office and no one's there. Um, so with that being said, uh, one thing that I would strongly encourage you to think about is how are you going to onboard this new force within your company? Now, that what we've seen as far as success in the onboarding is we get the originator that's about my age and they're doing a lot of business and they say, you know, I kind of like with, to develop a team and I'm going to bring in some millennials and I'm going to teach them the ropes and I will feed them the business that I don't really want. Um, or business I don't want to do with, or high maintenance real estate agents I don't want to deal with, but will still be part of the team. And while that's a nice methodology, I think that what's missing there is that you're not onboarding new millennials into a new way of doing things because they certainly have a lot to bring to the table. Um, there are some companies that have done this quite well and others that have not. 68% uh, of the first-time home buyers are going to be millennials, so we certainly want to understand them. They are super tech savvy and wonder why we're not. In other words, we ask for some basic information from them, and uh, they feel like they have to go through some craziness in order to get it to us, or some craziness in order to get information from us. Uh, they don't have a lot of patience for non-techie people. Uh, why? Because they grew up around it. So any of you that are my age and you have millennials, um, you probably run to them the first time that you need something. And so with that, um, you're going to see that you not, might need to up your game just a bit. Um, I certainly have found that I've had to up my game. If you're not a constant learner, then it's going to be tough to keep up with them. Uh, they love to communicate online. So really, whereas we would pick up the phone or we would drop by and visit each other, uh, they don't necessarily do that. They're communicating online quite a bit. They want to review you online, uh, which has its own ups and downs, right? Um, so they want to stalk you and see what your reviews are all about before they even call you. And they're more concerned about this whole lifestyle work balance. And if we're honest, so were we, and so are we. I know one of the reasons that I started originating mortgages is even though I knew I might be working more hours in order to maintain my status as a top producer, I had what I felt was flexibility in my life and a lifestyle work balance. Uh, so they're certainly good at that, which means to me that they make great originators. And of course, they're the most educated. Um, these are the people that have generally gone to college as a result, have an enormous amount of student debt, um, but they don't believe in being hired based on paper. In fact, if any of you have seen some of the new resumes that they come out with, it's more like a, a digital about me sort of card versus the standard typed one to two page resume. Um, so they're a very, very interesting crew. Uh, the next thing you need to look at, which is on the next slide, Dave, is the sales cycle for millennials. Understand that they are great self-learners. They don't sit around and wonder about things like our generation did. So we might be watching a program on TV and wonder about something and continue to wonder about it. They don't wonder about it. They Google it. Why? Because they have their phone beside them. They might have their iPad beside them. They're curious. They know how to, they want to learn how to fix something. They go on YouTube and look for videos. Um, so again, very tech savvy. Their sales cycle starts with online and not generally a phone call. Um, so don't go under the assumption that just because they're working with a real estate agent, they somehow will trust that real estate agent. They do not trust very easily. They don't blindly trust anyone, and they will do their research on you. So if their sales cycle starts with online and not a phone call, how are you positioned in that sales cycle? How are you utilizing technology to communicate with them a little bit better? And they're going to say, you know what, you have a phone number on a sign or a card. We're not going to call it. 
it's unlikely that we're going to pick up the telephone and have a conversation with you. Instead, they're going to try to look at you online. They're going to Google you. They're going to look for reviews. They might reach out to you via an email or probably, and most likely, a text. And from that, they decide whether or not they're going to do business with you. Now, another thing I learned is that the mortgage process confuses millennials. I think it, it confuses everybody, but certainly the millennials, um, they look at the mortgage process and just kind of shake their head. And I know that we do that as well. Um, and for many reasons, we're kind of caught in that cycle. Uh, meaning, oh, you know, this is the way we've always done it. And if we actually look at some of the regulations and guidelines, it doesn't mean we have to do it that way. In fact, others have broken that cycle, just like you mentioned, Dave, uh, with Quicken and uh, Guaranteed Rate and a few other companies. They've broken the way that we used to do business. And they're saying, we're going to try something new. And it seems to be resonating quite well with this group. Um, the difference is that with a millennial is if they're confused, they're unlikely to ask you as the authority. So they're more likely to start stumbling around on the internet and trying to find answers to the questions. And then they'll basically take an analysis from the, you know, the 10 questions that they happen to look at and the 10 responses that they got and decide whether or not what you're saying to them is correct or not correct, and then make their decisions as to whether or not they want to do business with you based on that. Um, so the more skilled you are at offering information that they want online, the easier it's going to be to do business with them. And that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love uh, Mortgage Coach and the way that it, it pushes information out to a consumer so that they're able to, to take a look at that and see what is it that's available to me and does this make sense to me. Those are the sorts of things that they're not really able to get online, just randomly searching. And so when you as a professional originator send that information out to them and you're communicating through your mobile device or you're communicating um, you know, through, your, through your email, but hopefully through your mobile device, because that's how they communicate the most, um, they're able to see some of the things and the, the difference that you bring to the table. Another thing that I found profound is, is that even when they're using Optimal Blue, um, you know, in my world at Optimal Blue, everybody has everything and they're all using it. But the reality is that's not the case, uh, because that's generally controlled from their secondary marketing department. And when I see things like, what do you mean you can't get to the mortgage insurance? It's right there when you get an interest rate. Well, what do you, no, it's not there? Why isn't it there? <laughs> and then you realize it hasn't been activated uh, by the company yet. So those are the sorts of things that you may need to, to micro look at to make sure that you're not kind of throwing these new people into the field without the proper tools to sound educated before they work with other millennials. And, and then down at the bottom there, they, they just don't trust. They, they don't blindly trust anybody. Um, they're going to do the research for themselves. And in some ways, that's good. But as we all know, on the internet, there's lots of opinion. And sometimes it's correct, and sometimes it's not correct. And as a result of that, you want to temper that as much as possible. Because if we go in with the assumption that you're not going to trust me or blindly trust me, then my response should be to make sure that I am providing you with the information that you're going to need in order to make a great decision. That whole, uh, I think you had called it, Dave, edu selling? Right. That what your word is? Yeah. So I think, again, that's a, a great way to go. So and in the next slide. I, real quick, before we go to the next slide, I just want to make sure everybody really connects on a few concepts. So when you really kind of net out all the differences, you know, between the millennial and let's just say the, the Gen X, the boomer, it really comes into two categories. One, you know, the, the, the millennials are a digital native. So whether it's how they use mobile, how they use Google, how they use video, it's more natural. It's a habit to them more. And, you know, it is a It can become a dysfunctional habit. But it can, if balanced well, be an incredibly productive habit 
And then, you know, the other thing I put it into is, you know, the fact that they're so mission-centric. I mean, let's face it, as human beings, we're all attracted to great stories, and we're all attracted to a mission that's bigger than just money. But the millennials are really attracted to a great story and, so, and a mission that goes beyond just making money. So, you know, I want to just connect the dots before we go to this next step that, you know, it's just, I, I think it's a fact, you know, when you look at Apple, who, you know, about a decade before they became the largest, most valuable, highest market cap country or company in the world, they started saying, we're a mobile company. We are a mobile innovator. You know, that is, that is again, this concept of go where the puck is going, that's old news. I mean, you look at Zillow and the market cap of Zillow compared to every other real estate company in the world, and you go, that that is where the puck is. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I guess the point I want to make right now before we go to some of these next slides is that every mortgage professional, you know, when you're doing your business planning, you know, my hope for this call, when you're sitting down and you're going, gosh, what are the disciplines that I need to master in 2016 so that I can have a breakthrough year, whether you're a branch manager, whether you're an individual loan officer that's struggling to close five loans a month, or whether you're a superstar loan officer closing 20 loans a month and you want to go to 25 or 30, I'm, going to, I'm trying to make the case today and with Tammy is that becoming a digital native and is, is important. And to me, it's not becoming a digital native just so you can, you know, leverage your technology, you can do Google searches. It's because that's the way you're going to be able to adopt the technology that's coming, and that's going to be the way that you're going to be able to deliver uh, an awesome, consistent experience to a family. So one thing that I'm really clear about personally is that, yes, disruption is happening, uh, and the companies that are going to get there first and the companies that are going to make the most money in 2016 and then sometime between now, I think it's debatable whether it's five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, when the mortgage business is completely unrecognizable, um, you know, who knows who's going to be king of the mountain then? But I'm, my case for every mortgage coach on this call, you can, you know, just double your business in 2016, regardless of market conditions, if you just got better with the tech that you have and you implemented it more effectively. So. Um, Tammy, I'm going to hand it back to you, and we'll go through this next slide. I just wanted to kind of put things in those categories and start really pushing everybody for what the goal of the call is. We're, we're trying to make a case as to, you know, why millennials are different, why they're special, and why we, you know, Tammy and I believe every mortgage professional uh, needs to adopt some of their best practices. Back to you, Tammy. Yeah, great, great points, Dave, and, and I think uh, with this next slide, you're going to see a lot of what you said, and, and these are actual, these are actual, this is actual feedback, not just from the, the three that I trained, uh, but since then I've done a lot of speaking on millennials, and, and I get a lot of emails from them, this is what I find, and this is what I find, um, and you, you see a common script, if you will, across their response to our industry. And as we get, begin to correct that, or I guess guide them, and they begin to correct it for us, uh, we're going to see some of this just change dramatically. Um, so the first thing that, that we realize is that we really are outdated to them. Um, things like emails, they're not big on emails. How they communicate seems archaic. Um, LOS systems. I hear a lot about LOS systems, and I, you know what? I, I think even boomers would agree. We're taking technology from 20 years ago, and we're trying to make it work in this new age, and it just doesn't. Um, so I would expect to see some major disruption, disruption in that arena. Guideline retrieval. When I was an originator, it was easy. You had FHA, VA, Fannie, and Freddie. That was it. We didn't have... 15 investors with 15 different overlays on one particular subject. And so for them, if you want to think about in your company, how do we access guidelines when we need to find out something? Do we call somebody? Is there a help desk? But more importantly, is it organized the right way? You know, there's, there's a big technology out there that everybody seems to use or say that they use, but they really don't use when it comes to this. And here's the reason. 
we don't have it set up the right way. So if you are a new originator, just kind of take off your old originator hat. I'm a new originator, and I need to find programs that will fit somebody with 3% down or 5% down, or I need to find somebody who's a little bit flexible when it comes to uh, perhaps border income, or I need to have a, a talk through about bankruptcies or foreclosures in the past, or we have a student loan debt deferred and I'm not quite sure what to do. They have no way to figure out it's here's what Fannie says and here's what Freddie says and here's what FHA says versus I need a 3% down program for a first time home buyer. What are my options? And I did this old school when I managed 200 originators. I had a binder and so I onboarded, had a very strict policy. We do 50% um, established people, 50% brand new people, and we were always onboarding because then I didn't have to deal with all the time, oh, we don't like this, so we're going to leave syndrome. And that worked out very well. In fact, we went from 120 million to 1.2 billion within two years in a non-refinance market. And we, they had a binder, and in the binder it had, here are the HELOC lenders, and, and here's how you get their guidelines, and here are the ones that, that um, can do some damage credit. And it was a full binder so that they looked it up by subject matter versus what is the guideline for Fannie. And then, of course, our communication to the client. If you haven't dealt with this already, you're probably dealing with it now. Um, the millennials don't like the emails, which is the next line item. They, they don't understand why we even email anymore. Some of them will participate in that because it's kind of the old school way of communicating. Um, but they're big texters. They like to text or they like to message. Um, those are the ways that they're communicating in our world. Um, so how we're communicating with our client, being able to use that mobile device on the fly I just can't stress that enough because that's what they're attached to. Where they're not attached to their computer. They're not even attached to their laptop. Some of them may be attached to their iPads. What they are attached to is that iPhone or whatever device they're using for mobile. Um, so even our process, uh, which is the next one to get a loan to closing, is outdated. And I can't agree with them more on this. It's interesting when you teach millennials from scratch. Um, these were all football players. One played or two played college level football. Um, so they're all about team and they're all about doing things according to a process. When you train them through the entire process as you're training them, they look at things as why? Why are you doing that? You've got this person that checks this person who checks this person who checks this person. Yep, that's how we do it. And the consumer gets to pay for all of those? That's correct. <laughs> so their perspective on how we process a loan, um, I know that many of us are forced to participate in that, but I, because of our investors, I think you're going to start to see, quite honestly, Dave, I think you're going to see, start to see some disruption in who the investors are. Because the people with money are smelling some money in our arena now, that the catastrophe is, is starting to end here. And as they start to see money, I think you're going to start to see new avenues, avenues um, open up that we didn't see before from those money people. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, no doubt. You know, when I break down, you know, call it the categories and buckets that need to change in order for, you know, true kind of an uber uh, disruption to take place, or a Facebook disruption to take place, or a Netflix type of disruption. There's no doubt that you know investor guidelines and who you know whether it's who the investors are or how you know they need to change their standards and their methods if we're going to have that call it uberfication of our industry. Um, you know, and that you know I don't know whether that's three years out, five years out, ten years out. Um, you know what I do. The more that you know, the millennial, the digital native becomes the majority, it has to happen. Uh, and in some ways, it's not even a tech issue. It's just a, you know, I even make the case that so many companies could literally make 2016 a disruptive year for the, their company if they just change their standards and their mentality. But no doubt, investors right, have exactly. to change. 
Yeah, and they will. And when that happens and the lion's share of the business shifts instantaneously over to other lenders, that's going to, uh, that's going to cause that hurt that I talk about that forces change. Right. Yeah, so um, look at your materials that you're passing out. Uh, I know that this is something that I just, I'm so thankful that I went through this adventure because it was something I didn't think about before. And I was about to create some training materials, and one of the things that I realized is that it's better to create them on a platform that can create the three types, which is mobile, tablet, and computer, um, at the same time versus creating them in like a, a PowerPoint as an example and expecting those formats are going to be acceptable. I know that's a little techie talk there, but but look at how these things are communicating. Actually send yourself a text with some of the stuff that you send to people uh, to see how it's coming out on your end in varying platforms like a, an iPad. Because some of the stuff that you send out may end up when they open it looking pretty garbled and pretty messed up and, and certainly not like you're, you're very tech savvy. Um, you got to know how to find out about anyone, um, so understand hey, Tammy, that they're going to Google you. Mm -hmm. Tammy, before you jump off that one, I did want to call attention. Uh, you know, the call that I did with Realtor Glenn Bill, part of, part of that call, the preparation for that, was I had a number of top realtors around the United States forwarding me the emails they were getting from loan officers and my ask to them was I won't share what you say just you know in 30 seconds or less what's what do you think top of mind about that marketing and I had this realtor Glenn Bell, Bill do the same thing and, and and what they had to say in 30 seconds top of mind um, it was not good you know I mean and part of it was to your point you know the tech that you know I, I get this on my I, I do everything on my mobile device and everything's designed for email so I mean part of it was you know exactly what you're applying but a lot of it was just it's the fact that loan officers automate noise you know they don't send things that are personal relevant and valuable they send things that they want to send you know it makes them feel busy but it's it's noise so I just want to put an explanation mark around that because I think if you want to have a disruptive 2016 you really need to audit what you're sending to realtors, what the touch points of what you're sending to a family, and yes, it needs to be digital, and it needs to work on all the various formats, but it also, it really needs to be valuable. It needs to be not, not what you want to send, what they want to receive. And, and millennials are great, because they, 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 they don't have any tolerance for fluff and BS. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that in on that bullet point. Uh, go ahead with the next one. Yeah, yeah, very observant. You're right, they don't. And especially when something comes across garbled, they're wondering why is it in that format if you're going to send it to me in that format. In other words, what is it, why does it look that way if you know that you're sending it to me via text? Um, so yeah, they, they don't have a lot of patience for it when it comes to that. Uh, for those of you that don't regularly Google yourself, um, you might want to start doing that just to see what the world says about you. Um, certainly, they're going to do it. So if they're going to do it, and I always say this in compliance as well, if the CFPB is going to do it, and if the millennials are going to do it, and you're not doing it, how do you know how you're being represented out there? Um, so it's an important thing for you to take a look at as a regular part of your business. Um, they really aren't as verbal. They don't like jumping onto a phone call and having a 30-minute conversation with you unless they have determined that you might be the person they actually want to talk to. Uh, but previous to that, in what we'll call the pre-sale, they like to text. And so you may leave 15 messages. And, and a good way to look at this is, is one of the ways that a lot of first-time home buyers start is is a lending tree or a Zillow as, as, and they put their information in and what they don't realize is they're going to get 40 phone calls from random originators all over the country and they find that annoying just like the rest of us but what they'll do is they won't return the phone call they might text the person or talk to the person so if you're in that lead lead strategy sort of part of your business you might want to think about how do I reach out to them via a text message as an example, not an automated text message, but some side of text message that sounds a little bit personal. 
uh, because that is how they like to communicate. Uh, we are well served, of course, to listen to their advice. Um, they've grown up with all of this. They know how to do things that it takes us hours to figure out. Um, so I'm sure like many of you, you just ask the question and you might be surprised at how easy doing your business becomes. Um, they're going to judge you by your online presence. So if they, if they see a really bad website um, or if they see an in, unfunctioning website like broken links um, or if they see an outdated sort of formatting, you will be judged by that. They look for the people who are more contemporary and slicker in their approach. And then, of course, their decisions are going to rely heavily on transparency and consistency. So they're watching you. You know, they might have two irons in the fire just watching two loan officers to see who, which one they eventually want to do business with before they write that appraisal tech, a check. Um, technology increases their transparency by putting the information they want and need at their fingertips. Well, you know, what better way to do that than something like the mortgage coach application? I don't understand this. I need you to tell me what it is I'm supposed to be looking at gets pushed out to them, they say, oh, okay, well, this kind of makes sense to me. It makes a lot more sense than talking about numbers. Now I can visually see this because we tend to be visual learners by the most part. Not everybody, but the majority of us are. And of course, they're going to stalk you before they do business with you, so be prepared for that. And the more information that you have available to them, in other words, you are educating them prior to them giving you the phone call, the happier they're going to be about that. So understanding what, what should I expect with the mortgage process? What does it look like? Why do they ask for some of this silly stuff? You know, you can get fun with it in a way that really resonates with, with what they do. So one, a couple quotes I want to just put an explanation mark around. And this, this quote came from Kristen Messerly, who um, was number eight on the top 12 with Steve Harney. And in that interview, she said something that I thought was so smart and so right on. And she said, transparency beats honesty. And, and I always, you know, I hear, you know, just amazing baby boomer loan officers that do a lot of business, totally kick butt, deliver an awesome service, um, you know, just kind of, you know, shrug at the millennial concept. And here's my, my message to anybody and everybody is that I believe that. I believe transparency beats honesty. You can be honest, but if you don't have a process that really builds that transparency in, you're, you're going to lose opportunities. And, and I do believe 2016 is a pivotal year. Disruption is happening in our space. So my message is get ahead of it. You know, audit your borrower conversation. Audit, you know, are you still the loan officer that doesn't provide options? that you say, well, people trust me, they like me, and they trust me, and they do what I tell them to do. So I don't give them options, I just give them one loan. I would just tell the loan officer that thinks that and believes that, that you are going to, you know, you, whatever success you've had in the past, it's going to dilute, you're going to get beat over time if you don't really embrace the concept of transparency, being proactive with families, showing them options, and delivering a borrower experience that just, you know, is it's unique and different in a wow because of the transparency. So, um, Tammy, back to you, but everybody think about that. Transparency beats honesty. Where are you at today with your borrower experience actually executing well on your transparency? You know, David, I, I would also add to that in that if your real estate agents are your face forward when it comes to the referral, uh, don't just assume that by virtue of that referral to you that they are somehow uh, building some sort of a trust that the millennial is saying, oh, yeah, okay, I will blindly go there uh, because they aren't like that. In other words, what is your real estate agent going to be able to present them with that makes you look a little bit more millennial oriented versus every other loan officer that's out there so that they are seeing that there is a difference and not just a name on the list. Yeah, well, the last thing before I pass it back to you, I do want to make the, I believe that what millennials love, everybody loves. I mean, everybody wants to get, you know, rate quotes, 
mortgage options on their mobile device. And the amount of people that look at Zillow and they have MLS in their back pocket is evidence of that. You know, this is not just for the millennial. You know, what, what millennials love, everybody loves. So uh, I just make the case that, you know, everything that Tammy is saying right now, it's like, uh, it's not just, you know, hey, I want to I wanna go out and go after the millennial marketplace. If you design your practice and your experience to be attractive and successful with a millennial, you will get more referrals from X. You will get more referrals from boomers. You will get more referrals and close more business from everybody. And you will have a more efficient organization and operation that will just plain old do more business. So it's not even about making millennials happy. It's about making everybody happy. This is just a path forward. Um, go ahead, right. Jamie. Great. Um, well, I also find it interesting to decipher what they mean because I learned a lot with this. Uh, one of the first things that I was warned by my my sons about, and I have three millennial sons, is I they heard me on a on a call and I was going to a conference and I said, "Awesome, let's hook up while we're out there." Well, they just about fell on the floor. They said, "You can't use that word or those two words." I said. Why not? That means I want to have a meeting with them or see them or talk to them. They said, Mom, that's not what hookup means. And so some of our, you know, ways that we say things are very different in their ways. And so we want to be cognizant of that as well. And good examples of that is let's set up a meeting. Okay? Well, boomers are saying that means we're going to have a face to face meeting or a discussion in the office or going to a meeting room. But the millennials, when they say that, they don't necessarily mean that. They can, we can Skype, we can text, we can jog together, talk, maybe go to Starbucks. Any of those meeting places are open options, and we don't even have to actually talk to each other to have a meeting. Um, if you say to them, please see me on this, it used to be that in our day when, when I would say that to somebody, that meant, I want to see you right now. Please see me on this. Well. In their world, they see it as, well, that means whenever I have the time to come see you on it, not necessarily right now. Um, collaboration, they have uh, boomers. We have this assembly line mentality, and I think that's because we came up in this manufacturing process. Uh, we collaborate on working on something, then we hand to the next person. And just look at our process. I'm the loan officer, so I'm going to do these tasks, and then I'm going to hand it to the opener processor, and then the processor is going to accomplish these tasks, and then it goes to the underwriter, and they look at that and, and say, hey, do you know that nowadays in other worlds, in other companies, we have, we have collaboration on things at the exact same time? And I think this is going to be a big disruptor in how we actually process a loan. So if any of you use Google Docs, and I was exposed to this in, in technology, you can actually have five or six people working on the same thing at the same time versus I have to finish all my tasks before I pass it off to the next person, which of course, as we know, causes extreme delays in how we process a loan. Um, so you might want to think, uh, think through that as you begin to redesign some of what you're doing. Uh, when we say, I love my community, we're actually talking about some place that's separate from our workplace. It's where we live. It's where we go to church. It's where we shop. Millennials see work as a community. Uh, since they're constantly connected and they work random hours of the day, so they're not your quintessential 8.30 to 5 people, um, that work environment is where they make friends and they find support. So if you are onboarding millennials, just a heads up, you want to keep them together, keep them talking, help them build that community and support. Um, another thing that's interesting is when it comes to mentors. It used to be, well, this person is my mentor. You would get the question, who is your mentor? You say that to a millennial, they probably have about 10 different mentors for different parts of their life and or business. And of course, let me check with the boss. Well, we see bosses as a person who is in charge. Millennials, and I was, it cracked me up, Dave, when I was watching Shark Tank the other night. They had a, a special on millennials. And they are so anti-organization chart. They're anti-corporate. They're anti-organization chart. 
So in their minds, the boss is not necessarily the one who's writing the checks. It's the person who has the best ideas or the best plan. Who's going to be the Pied Piper that's going to lead them to the correction that they're seeking? Um, so very, very different mentality when it comes to what they mean versus what we mean. And I think that things like this are helpful in order to help us relate to them a little bit more in what we do. Any comments on that or what you have seen as you interface with millennial population? Uh, I mean, I more things that I could cover. I'll let you kind of wrap up this slide, then I'll jump back in. <laughs> OK. All right, great. So and then finally, just to, to kind of wrap this up, listen to them. Take what you know as the sage, the old school person, the person who's been doing this for 20, 15, 20, 30 years. And Teach, let them teach you how to mix that with the new school way of doing things. They're highly creative. They think about new ways of doing that and be open-minded because these are out-of-the-box thinkers and they really can help you create a lot more business in a much easier way. And if you haven't seen the movie Intern, uh, which was one I reluctantly watched and now I've watched it several times, it's Be Googly. If you understand that whole googly environment, it's a great movie to watch and kind of acquaint you with how they work and how they collaborate. Um, our sales techniques they see are pretty outdated and old school. Um, not to mention many of the things that we do are extremely non-compliant in today's world. Um, so they look at that and wonder why are we still doing them if they're non-compliant and old school and really aren't resonating with this new mix of people that we're seeing. And of course, they, um, they're great hires. I, I talked about this 50-50 mix before. I, I think that if any of you are managers or responsible for bringing and recruiting, uh, don't, don't go down the road of, I only want top producers. Actually make a commitment to some of these new people. And I think that what you will see over time, as I did, is when I developed that attitude and every single week the sales meeting, it was actually a sales training meeting, over time, it helped develop some of the, the top originators out there, and they're still going strong. And that mentality really helped keep my business afloat, whereas with other people, they kind of went by the wayside because they were stuck on uh, what I call the old cancers. The old cancers are, this is the way I always used to do it. I don't like it if you're going to do this. I'm going to leave if you're going to do this. And they've always got this, I'm going to leave over your head versus I want to stay with you because this is an awesome place to work and here's why. Um, so keep that 50-50 mix and I think as you start to incubate that you're going to see how that's a real game changer. And finally just the last thing there is just up your game. I know it's difficult. I don't like learning all this new stuff particularly. I don't like learning how to implement it but I'm very surprised that as I do force myself to do that if, I, if you're not on LinkedIn and Facebook, they're saying, wow, do you even exist? Because everybody's on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, Real-time personalized information, if that's not on there. You know, all of this stuff, you have to start forward thinking a little bit to not only attract those as clients, but also to keep onboarding the proper people into your organization. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Yeah, well, let's just keep this conversation so going. So first of all, I want to be really clear. I'm not here, and this call is not about, you know, how big the millennial opportunity is as, as clients. While it is big, no doubt, in terms of first-time home buyers, it's the biggest opportunity. The point I'm trying to make is regardless of who your customer is, whether it's a millennial, whether it's a Gen X, whether it's a boomer, regardless of their personality, everybody wants a digital experience. And it's a better way to teach. And so the message I want to bring is that when we think of our workflow, I think coming into 2016, everybody should really look at their workflow. I mean, obviously, if you're in a, an executive level or you run a branch, you have the power to make changes more than you know, others. But everybody can, can adopt a best practice workflow, whether you're an individual LO, a branch manager, you can, you can influence the leaders above you and you can adopt what you have today better. Uh, and then think about the customer experience. What is the family getting? What are those touch points? Are they personalized, relevant, 
Do they deliver transparency, which equals trust and referrals? Um, you know, make it better, make it awesome. At Mortgage Coach, you know, we've we've been working on our our partnership platform for a long time. So our relationship with Optimal Blue, we rolled it out last year in 2015. I mean, we're taking it to the next level this year, and we're continuing to you know put Mortgage Coach button the ability for you to go from whether it's price to advice whether it's to go from prospect, you know, we're putting it in more places. Uh, we're really excited about our upcoming partnership with HBM, uh, where we're going to be rolling out the Mortgage Coach button within the HBM platform. Uh, but I, I do want to just show really quickly the Optimal Blue integration, because one, it just does a great example of showing how easy it can be from going from pricing alone to delivering advice. But the point I want to make is it just that, you know, whether you're on this call and you have Optimal Blue or not, every loan officer can improve your workflow. You know, now in this Optimal Blue, it's, you know, turn on the mortgage coach column. What loans do you want to forward to the family? Click the mortgage coach button and out comes something personalized, branded, and easy to share. So that when you share that with a family, you're not telling them how great you are. You're not explaining, I'm an advisor versus a loan originator. I deliver transparency. You're just plain old doing it. You know, they click on that link from their mobile phone, they get the mortgage coach mobile experience. You know, or if they click on it from a desktop, they get a desktop experience. If they came into your office and, you know, let's say you're in a market where they're not as tech affluent, you know, you're able, you know, this is, this is Marty Preston, you know, an incredibly successful mortgage professional that's going to close over 200 loans this year, you know, manages a branch that does over 170 million and brings people into his office in Kentucky still delivering a great experience. So, you know, my message to you, regardless of whether you're in a, a Seattle market like, like Jay Crowell, get your workflow in place, get your touch points in place. And all this tech disruption that we're talking about, you could you could literally make 2016 a disruptive year. You know, you just need to to make the plan. And so I hope over the next uh, couple of days, everybody on this call will get serious about business planning. Um, my hope is that you will use some of the building champion uh, business planning tools and make creating the mortgage coach habit a priority. Uh, I do, you know, every single Wednesday at 11 o'clock, we are doing mobile training. You know, we made it part of our weekly training rhythms because we do believe that the loan officer tomorrow is going to be a great teacher. You know, they've got their mobile phone in their back pocket. They're going to be able to pull it out anywhere and everywhere, and they're going to be able to teach, you know, whether that's rate watch and they just want to show what's happening in the market and forward that, whether it's having rate watch on their desktop, you know, they're always going to be in the position to leverage their mobile device as a teaching tool. So, uh, you know, I, I hope you join me next week. Uh, got a great mortgage coach. We're going to be having Wally from Cornerstone. He did a three, um, 328 loans in 2015. So an incredibly successful mortgage professional is going to be talking about how they're teaching marketing, you know, leveraging Mortgage Coach and other tools. And we've got an awesome cat um, lineup for, for January. I've got three amazing, very successful mortgage professionals and a great leader. So, so Tammy, I will give you the final thoughts. Uh, you know, coming into New Year's, a lot of people are going to be revisiting their, their business plan. They're going to be making plans. They're going to come out, you know, January with just a whole new attitude. Any, any last thoughts uh, as we wrap up today's call? Yeah, my final thoughts are really, really think about how you can begin to onboard the millennials into your arena and also how they're going to essentially be the ones that are going to start interfacing with the millennial real estate agents, the millennial builders, and be able to communicate properly with the millennial clients. I think that if you make that as a plan for next year, um, you're really going to have some major, major successes that you just didn't think was possible before. Really should supercharge the way that you do business. 
Uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you having me today. It was it was awesome, and I hope people were able to learn quite a bit. Yeah, no, you were you were fantastic. I hope to have you on other calls throughout the year. Um, please let us know what you thought of today's call on a scale of good to great. If you are new to Mortgage Coach or you're a guest, please uh, click the last option and we'll give you more information about Mortgage Coach. Uh, hopefully we inspired you, we made a case for making mobile a priority, and again, if you want to get tactical, you really want to turn some of the concepts that we shared into tacticals, come to either our Wednesday mobile training course or come to our Thursday training course or just watch the video. You know, those are all on our YouTube page our YouTube channel. You know, we've got videos and we're doing weekly trainings. Uh, anyways, Tammy, thank you to you and the entire Optimal Blue executive team. You know, we love the partnership and and we love how we're working together to disrupt the mortgage experience for the for the industry and for families. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Have a happy new year. You too. Bye bye.